Okay, so this morning I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Emily Gurley, who's a professor of the practice in the departments of epidemiology and international health at Johns Hopkins University. Um, she spent 12 years at the International Center for Diarrheal Diseases Research in Bangladesh, where she led uh, the Surveillance and Outbreak Investigations Unit and served as director of the Program on Emerging Infections. And her research focuses on multidisciplinary studies on the surveillance, transmission, burden, and epidemiology of a variety of emerging and vaccine preventable diseases, um, often using a, a One Health approach. Um, since 2004, she's been working to describe the ecology and epidemiology of Nipah virus, and she currently serves on the, WHO, the WHO's uh, Nipah virus task force. Um, for her work um, related to COVID-19, she received the Bloomberg School's Shikani El Hibri uh, Prize for Discovery and Innovation uh, for establishing the novel coronavirus research compendium, uh, which uh, many of you may remember, we, we referenced a, lo a lot over the course of the pandemic, um, and also leading courses in contact tracing that have been used worldwide. Um, so we're really excited to have her here this morning to discuss uh, mainstreaming spillover science and preventing the next pandemic, uh, lessons learned from COVID-19. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction and for the invitation to join you. Um, as, uh, as Spencer mentioned, I spent most of my career in Bangladesh, and I worked at a place there called the ICDDRB, um, and really started my career as a field epidemiologist. Um, so um the work that i do today uh well it's still based all based in bangladesh i'm actually hoping to travel there friday fingers crossed um and and most of the work that i do today uh, the research is all based in um problems that i encountered as a field epidemiologist uh way back in the day when i first started working in bangladesh um and nipah virus is 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 one of those <laughs> problems that I still work on today. Um, so I, I did prepare a few slides to sort of walk you through this. Um, so I'll talk about those. But so it was uh, part of my work in Bangladesh. Um, I was the director of the Emerging Infections Program. And we worked very closely with the government of Bangladesh and with the US CDC to set up surveillance for emerging uh, zoonotic infections. Um, we investigated outbreaks of anthrax, avian influenza, uh, Japanese encephalitis, uh, you name it, including Nipah virus. And so um, I've thought a lot about spillovers and we've spent a lot of our effort uh, with the team in Bangladesh trying to get better and better at finding spillovers of NEPA um, so that we can study them. Um, because unless you see those spillovers in real time, it's really difficult to figure out how they happen and even more importantly, how to prevent them. Um, so when you asked me to give a, a talk today, and you said anything related to COVID, I thought, okay, I, I'm going to use I'm going to use this opportunity to talk about spillovers um, because now, well, we all uh, um, are having a shared experience of uh, you know the painful after effects of a spillover that was very successful. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about why I think we need to mainstream spillover science, why I think it's so important. Um, and I'll go through, I think I have like 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll, I can take questions after that. Does that sound right for the flow? Sure. We, we actually have the, the full hour, but you can okay. use the time as however you want. Okay, great. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, if someone wants to jump in with a question as I'm talking, I'm happy with that too. Or, or you can wait, as you wish. Um, so I just want to remind folks sort of the timeline um, of our understanding of SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, so, and, 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 I, and I bring this up because this is the quintessential <laughs> timeline of events and recognition for most spillovers that you've ever heard of. Right. So the first step is, wow, there's this large cl cluster of human cases or sometimes animal cases of disease. 
uh, and we're not sure what it is, but something's happening here that public health recognizes uh, because it's sort of big and you can't miss it, right? So that was step one. That happens here, you know, on the timeline, right? So we're moving through time, but this is the first sort of recognition on our part. Um, step two then is to say, oh, well, there's transmission, something's going on, but by the time you sort of recognize that, um, the cat's already out of the bag, if you will, and there's already transmission happening beyond that first initial cluster. Um, okay, so then there's a problem. Then what's the next step? Well, usually, uh, then you go back and say, there's got to be a bat somewhere. So let's start looking through freezers to find bat viruses, um, or let's start, start looking in these bats to try to figure out where this virus came from. And because of the first SARS, they knew to look in rhinolophus bats, so uh, as, as possible reservoir hosts. So this is a cute little rhinolophus here. So that's sort of step three, right? Large outbreak. By the time you recognize that transmission's already, you know, sort of gone beyond that initial outbreak, you find the bat. And then step four is, well, where did that spillover happen, right? So chronologically, we're already really behind the ball by the time we get to step four and start thinking about how the spillover happened. Um, but this is how uh, this is how it's typically done, right? For the first SARS, MERS, um, uh, Ebola, <laughs> uh, the first outbreak of Nipah. Um, and so you, you, by the time you get to step four, often the trail is cold, right? It's already, the spread is already being propagated from person to person. Um, and so, well, I'll just show you. Um, so with Nipah virus, <laughs> the first identification of Nipah virus was in Malaysia in the late 90s during a large outbreak. And this was the exact same steps. There was a large outbreak identified. Uh, transmission was already happening throughout the um, Malaysian Peninsula. They look for reservoir host in fruit bats. So this is a Tropus medius fruit bat here. So different from the rhinolophus. And then they went back and tried to reconstruct how they thought spillovers happened. And that took years. Um, uh, you know, with the first SARS also took years. And who knows uh, how long it's going to take us to really come to conclusions we feel confident about uh, with SARS CoV 2. Um, and, and, and maybe we never get there. You know, that's always possible. Um, so. What I would like to propose to you is that we uh, we are all much better served if we are looking for these spillovers in real time. Um, and many of you, if any of you um, have studied public health, you'll probably be familiar with this figure, right? So this is the um, you know a visualization of a river and people are falling into the river. Um, and the idea is that the secondary prevention at the bottom is sort of medicine, right? You're trying to cure people, you're trying to keep them from dying from illness, um, but the goal of public health is to get to primary prevention. So you keep people from falling in the river in the first place. So I see spillover, so um, I see sort of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines against emerging viruses as sort of the secondary prevention, right? Once something already happens, we need these tools and they're really important to mitigate the impact of, of outbreaks and, and pandemics. But I would really love to see public health move to preventing spillovers, <laughs> right? Getting back to primary prevention, um, because I think that's really the mandate of public health um, is to try to get to close as primary prevention as possible. Um, and I also think there's good reason to believe that um, no matter, you know, with the tools we have today, I mean, I'm incredible, right, almost magical timelines for, for highly effective vaccines, um, I, I, I'm, I'm worried that it's still not enough. So let me show you this. Uh, figure. This, my, this was uh, put together by one of my graduate students named Sophie Rose. And what we're looking at um, is the timeline um, of days from an outbreak introduction uh, into a new country to when it's identified. So we're interested in surveillance 
for these novel uh, zoonotic infections um, or not novel uh, infections in humans. And our question here was, are we getting better at this over time, <laughs> right? Um, the, the original SARS really changed the world in terms of surveillance and um, you know, development of the international health regulations and how we share information with each other about uh, these um, uh, public health emergencies and threats. And we wanted to know, as technology and surveillance improves over time, do we get better? Are we faster now at finding introductions when they come into the country? So on the left here, you can see timeline, um, the timeline of SARS. The different colors are the different types of surveillance systems that picked up the introduction into new countries. So you don't have to worry too much about that right now. Um, but what I wanna show you really is sort of these days from the outbreak introduction to detection across various countries. And you can see on average here, this, this dotted line, it was about 11 days from the introduction or the arrival of a case of SARS to when it was detected in, a new, in that country, back, way back in the day, 20 years ago. Now for MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, another coronavirus, um, it's, a, it's a bit better, right? They, um, over time, our, our methods uh, to detect are better. And so you see that here now it gets down to about five days on average between when a case first happens and when it's, um, and when it's picked up. And with COVID-19, we actually got really very good. Even early on as uh, COVID uh, cases were arriving in new parts of the world, they were picked up very quickly within just a few days um and diagnosed within a few days that's not bad <laughs> um that's not that's not bad at all and we see encouragingly that we've gotten much better over time but troubling is the fact that even if we're there at the just a couple of days between introduction and detection is still not enough it still wasn't enough to stop a pandemic so emily can i ask um yeah. So how do you um, how do you define outbreak introduction? Um, are you trying to like go back and estimate like the true introduction time, or is this like the first known case? Or yeah, how do you how do you identify that? It's the first known case. So and and we track back. So she did a huge literature review um, to find all evidence of of the first initial cases into a country. Um, and it was the time gap between when that person, that case came to the country and when they were detected. So confirmed. So, so, there, you know, there have been some studies with COVID that mm -hmm. use like phylogenetic and other methods to try to figure out, you know, how much silent transmission there was in certain cities before the first, you know, known reported case. And, you know, in some, in some cases, you know, it's thought that there was, there were cases month or months before the first reported case. Right. So this only includes countries where we're confident that we know reasonably well when the first case was. So if there's like, um, you know, there were some initial cases like in Italy, where they're like, oh, maybe there was some, you know, some uh, PCR, banked PCR for measles surveillance that might have been positive. Um, WHO has never been able to confirm those results. So we, we relied on results that are believed to be credible by WHO. Um, and you're right. I mean, there are some places where we just don't know when the first case uh, was introduced, but there are many countries where uh, the data are pretty good. Um, but I mean, just uh, importantly, <laughs> we use the same methods across all three. So, um, you know, there could have been transmission also of MERS or of, of SARS that went undetected. Um, it's probably more likely with COVID. I, I agree with you. Um, if, if, if you're thinking that, um, but I think the, 
and and of course, you know, for countries that never identified a first case, they're not included in this analysis. I mean, there aren't 170 dots here. <laughs> um, so so it's not representative of all countries or, or 200 some, you know, however many countries we have now. Um, so these were just these were just the countries where we were able to get estimates that we thought were credible. Um, and so, yeah, lots of missing data and, you know, the countries that we're able to identify it may be, you know, even better than than the others. But still, I mean, you have a lot of countries here with credible evidence of their detecting the first cases within a day. Um, and, and it was all through primarily border surveillance, right? Because we knew the pathogen was was known and 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 diagnostics were developed really rapidly. But still not enough. <laughs> All that to say. Emily, um, one, do you yeah. have the feeling for how Ebola would look on these charts? I know there weren't nearly as many introductions, but um, you know, in, in the countries, but do you think it would be quicker because like symptoms are more obvious or something like that? Or sl slower? Um yeah, there aren't that many introductions really. Um so, I mean, if you're thinking about symptoms and, and, and severity in relationship to detection, I mean, often it is easier to identify cases that have more severe disease. That would be representative of SARS here. The first SARS was, you know, people were much sicker than with COVID, but we see an inverse relationship. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's, that's, all down to improvements in laboratory diagnostics. Um, um, but I, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure how how it would look for Ebola. I mean, um, you know, Ebola cases in Canada or in the U.S. I mean, there's a lot of screening and and quarantine and follow up that happened um, with with people uh, returning from. Uh, countries, particularly during the West African uh, outbreak. And I would guess that those were identified also pretty quickly. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, all right, let me um, just keep going. So, okay, so it, but this is just to make the point that we're getting much, much better over time, but it uh, still not convinced that that it was enough. I'm not sure, I'm a big proponent of surveillance. I think we can do a lot better with surveillance, certainly around the spillovers. Um, but you know, surveillance uh, to identify introductions is not is not going to do it. It's not going to be enough with it for a disease like COVID. Um, so this figure shows you. I mean, it's 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 courtesy of my uh, friend and colleague Raina Plowright, and this is from their uh, review and micro well Nature Microbiology reviews where they really try to set out all the different um, layers of a spillover. So what has to happen? Um, what are the, and on the left you can see here, like all, all the stars that have to align for a single spillover to happen. Um, so you have to think about the reservoir host, where are they? How many of them are they? Are they overlapping with, with humans? Um, and other uh, animals. What's the pathogen prevalence? What's the infection intensity? How much pathogen is being released uh, from the reservoir host? How long does it live? Um, how are humans being exposed? You know, importantly, wherever the um, you know, receptor binding sites are, have to be exposed somehow to that pathogen in the environment. And then, of course, the, the pathogen has to overcome our structural innate um, and other immune barriers for infection to actually occur. Um, so uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do um, uh, in our work together is put together data, like fine data to inform each of these layers so that we can get um, to a modeling framework that would explain spillovers. Um, I, I think, as I mentioned, I think finding spillovers is really important. So we've got to be doing the field work um, to identify spillovers before they come out, become outbreaks, before they become big pandemics. 
Um, that's the only way we're going to be able to prevent them. But um, I know you're a modeling group, so I would propose to you that there's a real important role for modeling here, um, you know, to mechanistically try to understand how spillovers happen. Um, and we're, I'm working with a group that's trying to do that now. It's very difficult. <laughs> um, I mean, if you're thinking about uh, modeling spillover from a reservoir host into, uh, in, in, into humans or, or, or other animals, there are a lot of, you know, obstacles. Um, there's a huge lack of data about spillover events, when, where they occur. Um, the data that are available are a bit biased, and, and that was mentioned uh, previously. Um, we don't even know, we don't even have a good idea of where reservoir hosts are in, in uh, much of the world. So rhinolophus bats, um, which is where we've found the viruses closest to uh, SARS coronavirus 2, um, so I work in Bangladesh, and we know that there are rhinolophus species in Bangladesh, but there are no good maps. And we've been trying to find uh, colonies where we can look for what kind of you know, coronavirus are circulating in those bats. And it's taken weeks uh, hunting through caves and different uh, parts of the country because there are just really no good wildlife maps of where reservoir species are. And I would also propose to you that geographic overlap of species. So just because bats are in a place and humans are in a place, it doesn't mean, um, or that's insufficient really to predict when and where spillovers are going to happen, because often it's a specific type of contact uh, that has to occur for the spillover to happen, you know, as we saw before. And spillover events are rare in any given place and time. I mean, in the world, they're not rare, but um, if you're looking at one community or even one country, they are rare. And so that makes it by definition difficult to, to model or, and to study. Um, and when we think about, um, you know, mechanistically <laughs> how to do this work, um, so from, you know, from the field studies where we're actually studying reservoir hosts, their distribution, the uh, viruses that they're shedding, the types of contact they have with other uh, animals through to the cellular level of how viruses are entering cells, right? So we're thinking through that whole chain of transmissions of spillover. Um, Doing work at, at all of those scales is very difficult, right? Often we need uh, high biosafety uh, containment laboratories, BSL-3 or BSL-4. You have to have multidisciplinary teams. So ecologists, epidemiologists, immunologists, virologists, um, physicians, wildlife veterinarians. <laughs> Plus you have to have folks with modeling expertise to try to pull this off. Um, and because the data layers are at very different scales, um, it's, it's difficult to, to figure out how to put all of these together in one uh, grand spillover um, uh, model. So I'm working with colleagues on a, on a grant, it's called Preempt Preventing Emerging Pathogenic Threats. And we're taking a stab at this, <laughs> um, starting small with trying to at least uh, work out how to model each of the um, individual layers and then hopefully coming up with a, a larger framework. But that's what I was going to share with you today, and I'm happy to chat more or hear more about what you're doing, if anything related to this. And 